What makes my thinker think is that he thinks not only with his brain, with his knitted brow, his distended nostrils and compressed lips, but with every muscle of his arm, back and legs, with his clenched fist and gripping toes. August Rodin. August Rodin was born in Mofitard, a working class district of Paris, to working class parents. He grew up sketching and drawing, and between the ages of 14 and 17, he attended the Petite École, a school in Paris which specialises in art and mathematics. It was here he developed his love for clay and model making. In 1857, Rodin submitted a clay model of a companion for admittance to the École de Beaux Art, to which he was rejected entrance. After several attempts to join the school, he went on to work as a studio assistant for more of the next 20 years, producing decorative objects and architectural embellishments. It was not until his mid-thirties when Rodin started work on the famous piece L'Age de Reine, The Age of Bronze. He was un- an unknown art craftsman at the time, but his use of material made lifelike realistic sculptures which cause an immediate mass interest. Here is a video of the exhibition at the Tate Modern on the making of Rodin. L'Age de Rhin, The Age of Bronze, was Rodin's earliest full-scale piece. It was a close observation and examination of Auguste Niet, a young 22-year-old Belgian Schultz soldier in October 1875. When the sculpture was first exhibited, it was so realistic that Rodin was accused of cheating and making the cast directly from the subject's body instead of sculpting the figure by hand. Offended by allegations of cheating, Rodin commissioned photographs of Nitt to show the anatomical differences between the subject and the art piece. While working on the figure, Rodin saved up his money to visit Italy for the first time in spring of 1876, where he got to study his idol Michelangelo's work in person and feed his love for classical Renaissance sculpture and architecture. The cheating allegations deeply affected Rodin and it drove him to create new images of the human body. Rodin first called it the Age of Bronze after it was exhibited, still in plaster, in 1877. It wasn't until three years later, when it was commissioned by the French government, that the figure was cast in bronze by Thibault Frez and gradually was being accepted as handcrafted work by the public. It was set up in the Luxembourg Gardens in 1884, now the Musée d'Orsay in Paris, where the original plaster was returned to Rodin. Rodin made new plasters from the original mould. Thereafter, more than 50 versions of the Age of Bronze have been cast and the birth of mass-produced sculpture began. The EY exhibition at the Tate takes inspiration from a major survey exhibition Rodin staged in 1900 in a constructed pavilion at the Place de l'Alma in central Paris. With sculptures from throughout his career clustered around the space, it was a replica of the artist's studio. Rodin worked mainly by modelling in clay. Once he knew what he wanted to achieve, he would use the clay to form a three-dimensional sculpture and then make plaster casts made of his clay models. Plaster casts were not recognised as being as important as works in more traditional materials like marble or bronze until well into the 20th century. Rodin used drawing to study movement and the dynamics of the anatomy. Dance had a heavy influence on Rodin, though he was not obsessed at, um, with classical ballet like Edgar Degas famously had been. The fluid movement of dance offered greater opportunities than that found with the premeditated nature of modelling. It seems he preferred a more solid, aggressive version of the art form, such as with Cambodian dancing, which he got to enjoy several times in Paris as part of a regular colonial show of Marseille in the early 1900s. 
this source of inspiration would lead to an outpour of several hundred drawings and watercolour paintings. To continue creating impressive sculptures, Rodin learned to use different combinations in his artwork. He was among the most prominent artists producing more than 10,000 drawings. He created these drawings in the late phase of his career when he was fascinated by the possibility of masculature, shape, tension and expressiveness contained within the body of the subject. After creating the Age of Bronze sculpture, Rodin's style shifted to depict motion rather than fixated subjects that were reminiscent of the traditional academic pose. His 1907 plaster carving called The Walking Man portrays this style where the fragmented figure without the head or arms has a twisted torso fixed on two also angled legs. After the 1890s, he focused primarily on female figures, but made it mandatory to not identify these women or personalise their nude bodies. His focus was dominantly on movement and the shape of the body, thus many of his drawings had little to no face features. Most of Rodin's artwork revolves around dance. As previously mentioned, he sourced his inspiration from cultural dances, which were a form of cultural exchange at the time. He enjoyed the Cambodian dance, which he enjoyed in Paris during his tours. A woman called Ota Hissa, born in Japan, performed under the name Hanako, meaning little flower. At 33, she was a well-known Japanese troupe, whom Roda considered strong and impressive. They met in 1906, when she performed at the Colonial Exhibition in Marseille. Rodal was fascinated by her stage persona. He was inspired by her Asian frame and her unique facial expressions and after early realistic portraits of her facial features, Rodal attempted sculptures to the same magnitude of expression. It was an expression so tense that she wasn't able to hold it for long periods of time. He found her different from the woman he came across in Western Europe and at the time went on to produce 50 busts and masks of Otta. More than any other sitter, it was not until Rodin's death that Otta finally received the two masks he had promised her in return for her labour. Helen von Notztitz was a German aristocrat, writer and socialite and was introduced to Rodin in the year 1900. She had visited his exhibitions in Paris at the Pavilion de l'Alma with family and friends and that was the start of a lasting friendship which led her family to commission a series of portrait busts which Rodin happily added to his studio's portfolio. Rodin modelled the first one of these in 1902. Then when von Nostitz returned to Paris in 1907, she sat for him again. Several plaster casts were made from the initial clay models. Rodin experimented with these casts, dipping them in plaster slip. The plaster solution filled the facial surfaces, softening the figures, features and giving an almost marble finish. Trapped air bubbles formed small craters while uneven layers of slip created wavering lines. Rodin made no attempt to disguise or remove these production scars. He actually added more, carving into the surface, surface of both the wet and dry plaster to emphasise its changing consistency. Another one of Rodin's muses was Camille Claudel. Born into a middle-class family in 1864, her father indulged her love for art and introduced her early to sculptors. By her mid-teens, she developed her love for sculpting and when she was 17, she joined her mother and younger siblings to move to Paris. Women artists were still a unique breed in the late 19th century and they weren't accepted into art schools. Her mother implored her to abandon her craft in favour of marriage, but she got a lot of support from her brother, Paul Claudel. Born four years apart, the siblings shared an intense intellectual bond that continued into their adult years. Much of Camille's earliest works, including sketches, studies and clay busts, are of her brother Paul. A major turn in Camille's professional life was when her childhood teacher, who regularly visited her studio in Paris to critique her work, 
passed on his duties to his friend Auguste Rodin to visit her studio while he went away to Italy. Impressed by the quality of Camille's work, Rodin offered her a job as a studio assistant in 1884, when she was then 20 years old. She grew from the being his assistant to his muse to becoming lovers and having a passionate love affair while influencing and supporting each other's work. Ten years after their meeting, their love intensified. However, Rodin did not want to break from his long-term partner, Rose Bouret, which drove Camille to end their relationship. They remained on good terms professionally, and in 1895, Rodin supported Claudel's first commission from the French state. The resulting sculpture, L'Age Mure, 1884-1900, comprises three nude figures in an apparent love triangle. On the left, an older man is drawn into the embrace of a crone-like woman, while on the right, a younger woman kneels with her arm stretched out, as if imploring the man to stay with her. This hesitation at the crew, crux of destiny is considered by many to represent the breakdown of Claudel and Rodin's relationship, specifically Rodin's refusal to leave Rose Bouret. The plaster version of La Jumeure was exhibited in June 19, 1899 at the Société Nationale de Beaux Art. The work's public debut was the death knell of Claudel and Rodin's working relationship. Shocked and offended by the piece, Rodin completely severed his ties from his former lover. Camille's state commission was subsequently revoked. Although there is no definitive proof, it is possible that Rodin pressured the uh, Ministry of Fine Arts to end its collaboration with Claudel. Following this, she struggled to find support because her work was deemed overly sensual um, and ecstasy, after all, was considered a male territory. And in such a male-dominated profession, recognition of her work deteriorated. Played by financial trouble and rejection by the Parisian art milieu, milieu Claudel's behaviour grew increasingly erratic. By 1906, she lived in squalor, wandering the streets in beggar's clothing and drinking excessively. Paranoid that Rodin was stalking her in order to plagiarise her work, Claudel destroyed most of her oeuvre, leaving only about 90 examples of her work untouched. By 1911, she had boarded herself into her studio and lived as a recluse. At her family's request, Camille was admitted to a psychiatric, psychiatric hospital and lived the rest of her life diagnosed with mental health issues until she died in 1943 at the age of 79. Prior to Rodin's death, Rodin approved a dedicated display of some of Camille's work in the museum he left to the French state. Thus, her contributions and her work will forever be recognised and celebrated, shining further light on the truth of their relationship and that Rodin was influenced by her talent, style and craftsmanship. During the making of The Gates of Hell, Rodin built up a collection of individually modelled heads, arms and legs. <clears throat> Small hands especially filled drawer after drawer in his studio. Rodin liked to call them abatis, which translated means giblets. Multiple plaster casts were produced of each limb. Rodin reworked these casts, experimenting with their proportions and orientation. Sometimes they broke and these accidents could inspire further alterations like putting the parts together in different configurations. These giblets have never belonged to just one figure but represented a stockpile of parts to draw upon. Hands also frequently featured in the photographs that Rodin commissioned of his sculptures. Rodin exhibited photographs alongside his sculptures for the first time in 1896 at the Musée Graff in Geneva. Furthermore, Rodin was fascinated by the fragmented state of ancient Greek and Roman statues. Some of them had been damaged over time, others were broken when they were forcibly removed from their place of origin. Rodin started to present some of his work in a similar way. 
The inner voice was initially part of a group of three figures which Rodin conceived as part of a monument to the writer Victor Hugo. The knee was first broken off to fit the sculpture into the monument. Eventually the figure was enlarged and presented on its own. Rodin insisted on keeping the knee deformed and without its cap, embracing its removal as part of the object's history. Another innovative strategy was to use the multiple casts of the same figure. As seen here in the three fornices, there are three identical female figures which were all replicated, replicated from the same cast. Also here in the three shades, a singular male figure purposefully named Adam was similarly repeated to make three identical figures presented as either an individual piece or a collective. This new form of sculpture was a distinctive change from the traditional Roman and Greek statues which were previously commonly formed. Rodin was an avid collector of ancient artefacts from Greece, Rome, Egypt, Japan and China. Between 1893 and 1917, Rodin had collected over 6,000 pieces. Many of the objects were purchased primarily from Parisian antique dealers and housed in a special building at his home and studio in Meudon, outside of Paris. The 1900 exhibition made Rodin internationally famous. The style in which the work was presented at a studio rather than displayed behind glass boxes and velvet ropes was an innovation many at the time opened up to. Furthermore, to spark interest, Rodin kept revisiting his existing works to invent new ones. And to top it off, the rawness of his finished work kept people curious and invited viewers of his work to retrace the process of their making. Rodin deliberately left imprinted finger gorges and nail marks from his hands. During the First World War, Rodin took refuge in England and Italy, but when he suffered from a stroke in 1916, he died the following year at his home in Meudon. With his wife and long-term partner Rose Bure, they were buried in their garden next to the re-erected Pavilion de la Mal. Al there, their graves are marked with the bronze cast of Le Pense, the thinker. Thanks all for listening and I hope this was an engaging video. Here are some of the references which I've also put in the description below. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up and for more videos on exhibitions to visit, subscribe to my channel. A bientôt!